Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and this is part of our month of Gnostic terrors, the horror of existence, uh, as we're doing Halloween themed programming, Silent theme programming, Day of the Dead, All Saints Day programming, and today's theme is on folk horror. We have a writer and podcaster, Howard David Ingram. Uh, hello, Howard. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi. Hi. It's a pleasure. Uh, Howard is the author of We Don't Go Back, A Watcher's Guide to Folk Horror. Uh, and uh, we're going to dive right into talking about folk horror, talking about his book. But before we do, uh, I have to do our commercial for our Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can help us keep the show going and you can help us expand. We actually want to do more programming. If you are a fan, you've probably noticed that we have been doing a lot more programming. You can put a cap on that dollar per piece of media per month if you're worried about us, you know, doing a million pieces of uh, uh, media that we run through it. Though generally we do like five, six pieces of media is what we charge for. And then uh, we actually produce anywhere from 10 to 15 per month. So if you uh, want to do one-time donations, you don't want to screw around on Patreon, you can go to paypal.com slash Gnostic. And of course, we understand these are difficult times. You may not necessarily be able to help us out financially. So tell people about the show, like and subscribe, share it on your social media, what have you. Okay, Howard, we're through that. Um, I know uh, opening with a big question, uh, but I guess if you could give us sort of the elevator pitch, the, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the short, uh, punchy uh, uh, the summation of what is folk horror? Folk horror is the horror of folk, which sounds really glib, but in fact, actually, that's pretty much the heart of it. It's about the horror stories that are based upon specifically um, the workaday dealings of people and about how people get strange and about how people create hauntings. It's different from Gothic horror. Um, Gothic horror. Um, you'll have a Transylvanian castle with, um, you know, an 800 year old um, guy who says, welcome to my house. And folk horror, you'll have an island full of cheery people. And there's a laird in a big house. But you can go and visit him and have a cup of tea. And often you get the juxtaposition. And what I like talking about is the juxtaposition of the prosaic and the uncanny. The idea that you can have the devil round for a cup of tea. You have the, the classic example is, is the medium who very much a working class or aspirational lower middle class kind of thing rather than the high magician. The medium is the sort of person who lives in a suburban house, lives down your road. You have as a neighbour, um, in fact, my mother who lived in a terraced house and still lives in his Harris house in Plymouth, is a medium. Um, and that sort of thing makes it different from other kinds of horror, which can often be more direct and are often more distant as well. And uh, I mean, I guess kind of answering this question, but it, you know, your, your book covers qu quite a few films over quite a few uh, decades, uh, over quite a few different countries and cultures. Um, There's well so over a hundred in there, I think, if I remember right. <laughs> exactly. So can you tell us a little bit more about, about some of the factors that are uniting them? Because I think some people, and maybe you have gotten feedback, I don't know, but I wonder if picks like, like Ring and Pan's Labyrinth and Watership Down are controversial. So if you could talk a little bit more about that, about the, the what unites them and uh, about the terror of the folk and uh, uh, the, how that is reflected in, in some of these films. Okay, so there's a film theorist called Adam Scoville and he wrote the first book about folk horror. Um, the second book about folk horror is really a collection of essays produced by Folk Horror Revival called Folk Horror Revival Field Studies. So mine was basically the third. Um, and this is a few years ago, obviously there's several books about folk horror now. Um, because my book came out in 2018, in fact. Um, but Adam Scoville says that there's a folk horror chain. Um, that there is 
um, an isolated area. Um, and the trick is actually that this isolated area has to be isolated, but close enough to get to fairly easily, which is why photo is really common in the UK because there's no part of Britain that is untrodden. There's no wilderness in Britain. The, mo the wildest places in Britain are very well trodden and well mapped. There are only abandoned places, not uninhabited ones. Um, so you've got this landscape, isolated but easy to get to. The isolation affects the people who live there. They will have an odd approach to their lives. They will have unusual beliefs. Something will happen in the course of a folk horror narrative that will cause a summoning or a happening of some kind. And that may or may not be supernatural. Um, now, you mentioned Ring, Watership Down, and what was the other one you mentioned? Um, um, uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth. Okay, so actually those are not controversial films in my book. Um, Ring is interesting because Japan, you have a an island nation that used to have an empire that has um, people concentrated in cities and scattered people around. And in a lot of ways, I mean, obviously it's a completely different culture, but in a lot of ways, that basic milieu is essentially how things are in Great Britain. And the haunting in Ring expresses itself through everyday objects, everyday mundane objects. You have a folklore manifestation. In the case of Ring, it's a yokai um, that breeds a girl who's half spirit, half human, who is killed and her ghost haunts in a well. And a well is like, you know, the quintessential folk horror um, landmark um, goes back to M.R. James, in fact. Um, and then that manifests itself through everyday ordinary technology. And in the case of Ring, a videotape. That videotape has an urban myth. Urban myths are also part of, or at least at the very least, folk horror adjacent. So Ring's part of that. Watership Down is folk horror partly because of where it went and where it was made. And we're going to get to that in a minute, I think, I think, because you sent me the questions in advance. So I've been primed. So we'll talk a bit more about that later on. But also because yes. you um, have ra rabbits in a field. The spiritual revival. It's, it's something we talk about on the show sometimes. Um, right. And it's, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, viewers, listeners who, who are pagans. And this, this spiritual revival draws on some of the same sources, thinkers, and symbol sets as folk horror. And did you see a, a spiritual, philosophical side to folk horror, or is it all just for fun? I think, and I've been writing about other kinds of horror recently. Um, I, I've, got, I've got a book coming out about um, identity horror. But the horror of body, mind, and sexuality. Um, all of these come from something. All horror has basically a spiritual, a political, a personal element to it of some kind, because horror is fundamentally cathartic. Horror of all the popular genres is the one I think that most reflects the anxieties of the time we live in. And the fact that the first films that we now recognise as folk horror came out at about the time when the pagan spiritual revival and the New Age revival really gained traction is not unrelated. Now, my personal theory is that people tend to be interested in 
let's say non-standard spiritualities, non non-endorsed by the by the government spiritualities. Um, and of course, Christianity in the UK is endorsed by the government. We have a state church, um, or at least they do in England. I live in Wales, where we don't, where we don't, and it's kind of different. But there's a state church in England. The Queen is the head of it, as well as being the head of state. Um, people get into non-standard spiritualities when there is a sense that history has unfinished business. Right. So in the 1970s, uh, right up from the late 60s through to the early 80s, so let's call it the long 1970s, there was a period where, in the UK at least, we had um, economic uncertainty, we had big arguments about whether the UK should be part of the European Union. Bigger, hard right political parties that didn't gain any political sort of power, but were always on the news and always being talked about and had celebrity leaders. And all of these things, again, austerity, poverty, the rise of racism, all these things in the early, seven, early mid 70s, which created a sense that things were not going well. Britain, at the very least, was a bit crap. Um, and it's at that time that people start looking ahead because people are haunted. Jacques Derrida came up with the idea of hauntology. And hauntology is literally the idea that the past has unfinished business with us and is performing terrorist attacks on the present. China Mieville called it a radicalized past, which is kind of nice, a terrorist past. And that's what a haunting really is. It's the sense of unfinished business. All hauntings are about something unfinished, undone. Um, you compare to the 1990s when Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History. He said that, you know, history's over. Um, Western liberal democracy, neoliberal democracy was the end of history. It's where all political systems were going. You can see communism falling. Boris Yeltsin, what a great guy. He's going to do great things. All those things, right? And everything's fine. In the UK in 1997, a um, centrist version of what used to be a socialist political party swept into power on a landslide. And they used, at the time, the hip hop song, Things can only get better by D Ream, um, which is hilarious because the keyboardist of D Ream was Professor Brian Cox, now the, the physicist. Um, and he has, I believe, never lived out the fact that that fundamentally breaks the second laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> but anyway, um, in the 1990s, there's not a lot of haunted horror movies. If you look at the horror movies made between 1993 and about 1998, most of them are either science fiction horror movies. So there's an alien sequel, there's a couple of species movies, there's The Faculty, there's, a lot, there's the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers because every decade since the 1970s has had a remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And, um, I think, and lots of sci-fi movies, or you've got, I think the most popular horror movie of the decade. There were lots of remakes, lots of arch meta remakes of things like The House on Haunted Hill and The Haunting and things like that, which were full of CGI and were very unreal and cartoony. And the most popular horror movie of that era was Scream, which is a movie about horror movies. And it's only in 1999, when you've got the Blair Witch Project, that you had a popular folk horror movie made in the English-speaking world. You know, Ring came out in 1998, I believe. But in the US, um, it didn't receive um, a domestic release until the American remake had been released. In the UK, we got it long before. But no one in the US saw 
um, ring, except on bootleg copies, until um, Gore Verbinski had made his version, which is interesting. Is that right? But anyway, again, another side, another tangent there. Um, so folk horror happens because there's a sense that things are fundamentally crap. And since 2001, um, I don't need to tell you the date, do I? Um, there's this feeling that things have been gradually getting worse. And that's not even politically bound, because it's fair to say that people on both ends of the political spectrum, on both sides of the Atlantic, have decided that things are getting worse. And how that, is, how that is expresses itself depends upon your political position. But there's a sense that things are terrible. You know, the a slogan like Make America Great Again assumes that America is really not great. You know, it doesn't mean anything. No one knows exactly when America was in fact great or which particular sort of great they're talking about. Um, likewise, the Brexit slogan, take back control, is great. It's interesting. It doesn't, it means we don't have control. It's a sense that control is missing, even if we don't actually know what we're supposed to be in control of. And that sense of inchoate unease is haunting. And then you get movies about people in the middle of the backwoods doing strange things. And to think of one Central American folk horror example, um, hexing people who to give them lifts and making household accoutrements out of bits of people who they've eaten because they're too poor, you know, and murdering people with lump hammers but not chainsaws because only one person dies of a chainsaw in that movie. So why do they call it the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? <laughs> Total trading standards violation there. I don't know what's going on. Any, sorry, sorry. It's more of a, it's more of a Texas Chainsaw kerfuffle, really. Um, excuse me for a second. I just getting overly excited, but yes, um, the point is, that there's a sense that something's wrong and that's political and it's on the ground and we are haunted by something that loss of control that sense that america was great kind of isn't anymore and those things are absolutely central I think, to why folk horror movies get made. Um, pivoting, but uh, I, I think something that uh, that might surprise uh, some people who uh, are picking up your book, everybody who hasn't read it, go pick it up, um, is uh, yes, a, chap a chapter, uh, Folk Horror for Children. Um, the, uh, does such a thing exist? I think a lot of people would be really surprised by that. Can you tell us more about it and, and maybe why, and I put this in, in scare quotes, but you know, why quote unquote children should, uh, watch or engage with folk horror? In the 1970s, um, children's television was spooky in the UK. I, I think kind of hit the US a lot later. Um, I think there's a generation of people who are a generation younger than me who um, remember things like Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark and Eerie Indiana and things like that um, from 1990s in the States. Um, but in the UK, in the 1970s, right up to the 1980s, kids' TV was frightening. And now, it's not to say it's better, now it's much more formally complex. There's a TV show, for instance, called Horrible Histories, which is possibly the most meta television show you've ever watched. And hilariously funny if you're a parent, which I'm a parent. But um, a lot of the British folk horror renaissance material 
which started gaining traction towards the beginning of the 21st century was made by people who remembered being scared out of their wits by Watership Down or Children of the Stones or Bagpuss. And that comes forward. There's a sense that what um, Bob Fisher calls the haunted generation, a sense of people who, for some reason, there was a lot of very frightening television for children in the 1970s. And then by the time all these people were hit, late 30s, early 40s or so, and are making TV, they're drawing from those things. And also from the adult movies of that era that they kind of snuck downstairs to watch when they were eight years old, when they're being broadcast at 11 o'clock at night on the telly. And that's very much thing. So it's not that it's necessarily folk horror for children, although I think there's a value in being scared. I think it's the fact that a lot of children's TV in Britain in that era was freaking terrifying, including a lot of things like the um, public information films, which would have been shown while chil which were shown, in fact, I remember this, while children's television was being broadcast. And they would be absolutely terrifying short films paid for by the government um, about why you shouldn't swim in lonely pools of water and why you shouldn't play in building sites and why you shouldn't um, play with frisbees next to electrical pylons. And these things are insanely gory. They were designed to put, I don't know if you could swear in this podcast. Yeah, please go, go for it. Put the shits right up a generation of children. Yeah. Okay. The spirit of dark and lonely water was voiced by Donald Pleasance. Okay. I am the spirit of dark and lonely water. And it's just part of our child and part of the cultural child, cultural background of people who've basically decided that folk horror is a thing and needs to come back. Which is another question. And I think you're going to ask me about that. Well, how did you know? <laughs> um, because yes, you sent me the so... questions before the podcast. <laughs> You can read minds. They can read minds. <laughs> See right into me. Um, Howard, uh, yes. So, I mean, you kind of already answered this, but uh, the why at least, but I'm sure you, you will have more to say about it. But there does seem to be a folk horror uh, renaissance, right? Like like you mentioned, like there hasn't been any books about folk horror, and you wrote one of the first ever. And I think of movies like Midsommar, which was uh, a big hit, big sensation, uh, The Vavitch. Uh, I know that's not how what it's said, the witch. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the folk horror renaissance and I guess elaborate on uh, why? I, I think we can probably guess the why when you're telling us a, a bit before with the insecurity um, and people feeling like the world's going down the toilet. But yes, tell us tell us about this, this new folk horror renaissance. Okay, well, for one thing, I don't think it, there is actually a rena renaissance, actually. I think it's just folk horror becoming a thing. Um, having said that, the biggest online community um, about folk dedicated folk horror is, of course, Folk Horror Revival, which you can find on Facebook. And tens of thousands of members, like any Facebook group, it invariably have pictures of spooky trees, but also has loads and loads and loads of really interesting resources, um, links to movies you hadn't heard of, books you hadn't heard of, all those sorts of things. It's, basically the place you go if you want to find out about folk horror stuff. Um, but um, I don't think there's actually a folk horror renaissance because that would have meant folk horror was a thing in the 70s when it first started. And what actually happened was that a number of films were made which, after the fact, were described as folk horror. It's a retrospective genre. The first person, well, not the first person, actually, the first person, but like the first person to use folk horror in a way that gained traction was Piers Haggard, who directed the movie Blood on Satan's Claw. 
which is considered to be one of the foundational folk horror movies. Um, and in 2003, he's being interviewed by Fangoria, and he's just asked about Blood on Satan's Claw, because it's one of the great unsung... Well, it was one of the great unsung classics of um, British horror cinema. Now, it is very much a film that I think successfully been reappraised. Um, my, my take on it is actually that I don't, I don't particularly like it all that much. But, um, but I'm an outlier. I'm very much in the minority. Um, generally, horror fans consider Blood on Satan's Claw to be a classic now, but they've only reappraised it in the last decade and a half or so. Piers Haggard said, I wanted to make a folk horror film. In about a few years later, Mark Gatiss, um, the British actor, writer, broadcaster, did a series on the BBC called The History of Horror. And he did an episode where he did an entire section about folk horror. And he interviewed Piers Haggard and he said, folk horror, the wicker man, witchfinder general, blood on Satan's claw. Ghost stories for Christmas. Bagpers. You know, and you go from that. And these foundational sort of like capstone texts of cinematic and televisual folk horror um, became the central thing where we can go, hmm, well, there's a lot of things that happened in the 70s that were kind of like that. Is that folk horror? Is that folk horror? Is, maybe that's, no, that's not folk horror. Or is it? And that sort of thing. And then people who are part of that haunted generation, people in my age, in their 40s, who are making movies, start making movies that reference those things. So, for example, Mark Gatiss, Rhys Shearsmith, Steve Pemberton, and Jeremy Dyson did a comedy series in the early 2000s called The League of Gentlemen, which essentially is a horror comedy, which is full in every episode of references to 1970s folk horror texts. The Wicker Man, Nigel Neal's television plays, all sorts of things like that. They're all there. Um, and that was huge. And so much so it got revived a few years ago. You've got um, Ben Wheatley, again, part of my generation. And he made Sightseers and Kill List and A Field of England in England, which are folk horror movies. And then people who like this stuff, who might live in the United States or Canada or Europe or Asia, go, well, we've got our own version of folk horror. Um, there's a great, great guy I've been talking to in the last couple of years called Fabio Camaletti. He's Italian. He's been doing work on what he's called Aurori Popolare, which is the Italian version of folk horror. Um, a lot of which is 1970s Italian movies set in Britain. I mean, it's kind of weird Britain where everybody speaks Italian with subtitles and lives about five minutes drive from an ancient decaying mansion, even though if they're in the middle of London. And these movies are again a thing as well. Um, and movies like Don't Torture a Duckling, um, which is one of Lucio Fulci's giallos but it's unusual for a giallo movie because it's set in the countryside and has a woman who's a witch in it and there's a literal witch hunt in this movie um as well as people getting stabbed up and someone saying i know who the killer is and then dying five seconds later which is what you get if, if you're ever in an italian horror movie i don't know if this is gonna happen to you but if you are pro tip never say i know who the killer is meet me at the alley at the back in five seconds and i'll tell you because you will not make it out of that alley um so you've got that, and then you look at some Asian films. Like you can look, look at Ring. I know one reviewer of um, We Don't Go Back looked at Ring and said, well, why isn't Cairo Pulse in this? And the simple answer is I hadn't got read around to writing an essay about Cairo before it was time to make the book. But um, this is a great movie. You should watch it. Um, this has got a similar sort of thing, hauntings transmitted through everyday technology in the case of Cairo is dial-up internet connections um you look in European films like Calvaire 
um, or the ordeal, as it's called. Um, these movies present different sorts of things. A Russian movie called V, which has made it into the Severin Films um, folk horror box set, which I should remember the name of is temporarily escaping, but they've done a 12 disc Blu-ray folk horror box set, which includes 20 movies from all around the world, including some I've never seen yet. I'm, I, I'm lucky enough to be actually getting a copy because I'm in the box set because it also includes um, Kayla Janice's documentary, Woodland Stark and Days Bewitched, A History of Folk Horror, which is a fantastic documentary. You should see it when it finally hits the streaming serv services either at the end of this year or the end of next year or whether it's Blu-ray. Um, despite the fact I'm in it as one of the talking heads. Um, apparently I'm, I'm in it so much because I'm easy to edit because I pause between my sentences. Um, I'll take it. it. But yeah, and they've done this box set. It includes an Australian film called Alison's Birthday. It includes V. It includes a, a Yugoslavian film um, from when that part of the world was called Yugoslavia, called Lepterica, the She Butterfly. Um, all these international expressions of folk horror are in there and it draws them together and and Kayla, Kayla's documentary as well is fantastic it's got an entire section about international folk horror how does things are but films being made as folk horror are a new phenomenon mm. I think the first deliberate folk horror movie of any real import was a film called Wake Wood, um, which is about an Irish community that has pagan secrets and a an unfinished business, a haunting. Um, it's got a heavy political element and it's about class. Um, not a particular fan of it, but it's still quite an important film. Not least also, it's also the first film to be made um, by the revived Hammer Studios, which is another haunting. You've got the ghost of Hammer rising from the grave. So there's a thing as well. So Wakewood is kind of a landmark because you've got this sort of thing rising from the grave, becoming, becoming new, becoming um, its own thing. So deliberate folk horror movies. People, people are now going... I want to make a folk horror movie. I was fortunate enough to interview Ari Aster a couple of years ago um, at the Motel Gish Film Festival in Lisbon, which is a great time, let me tell you. But anyway, um, interviewing Aster, he said that he had been approached by a Swedish film company who said, could you make a folk horror festival set in a midsummer festival in Sweden? Oh, I didn't know that was the origin. Fascinating. Which is interesting, not least yeah. because one of the criticisms that some people level against Midsummer is is, is that they criticise it because they think that it's sort of othering towards Swedish pagan customs. But it was totally the Swedish pagans who came to Ari Aster and said, can we have a folk horror film, please? And we've seen Hereditary, so we know you can do it. Um... So Ari Aster makes a folk horror movie. He makes a folk horror movie without watching The Wicker Man, Blood on Satan's Claw, Witch Finder General, but still find, makes a movie that has their, their DNA in its blood. Because the ideas of folk horror had by 2018, when he was making the movie, become so popular and ingrained in our culture and so much part of the political landscape, he couldn't not. And I mean, The Wicker Man is a sort of film. Um, I like to compare The Wicker Man actually to Planet of the Apes, actually, for several reasons. One, it's one, they're both films that on my DVD shelf have the final twist on the front cover of the DVD. <laughs> Two, um, they both got early 2000s remakes by directors who really should have known better, which were really bad. And three, they're both movies that have enough cultural traction that you know how they go, even if you've never seen them. 
And that's really important. And actually, you know, he was actually tricked and they wanted him on the island all, the, all along so they could use him for a human sacrifice because he's an evangelical Christian and therefore he's never actually known the love of a woman. Or he was on Earth all along and didn't realise until he fights the Statue of Liberty. I'm really sorry if you haven't seen Planet of the Apes. Still worth seeing. Um, they're the same thing, really. Um, not that Planet of the Apes is folk horror, because it is. But... I, I, it's one of the things when you sort of people go look at an old movie and go is that folk horror or is this folk horror um, sometimes you will get a visit from the folk horror police <laughs> online so you'll say a film it's very much a folk horror text so one of the central American folk horror texts for me is um, Jordan Peele's Get Out mm -hmm. which for me is the American Wicker Man mm. or would be if the Texas Chainsaw Massacre wasn't already but it is the American Wicker Man. It's a, it is a quintessential American horror movie with a profound political point that has all the folk horror tropes and again has the occult creeping into what seems to be science. Because I'm, you've seen Get Out, I hope. Yes. One of the things about Get Out is that the more you think about the scientific basis of what the bad guys are doing, the less sense it makes. Yeah. Unless you pay attention to the hilarious um, infomercial for the process in the middle, which ends with someone going, behold the coagula, which of course is a reference to Eliphar Levi. It's one of the things written on the arms of Baphomet. They're doing magic, but they're clothing it with science because, and this is one of the things I love about it, Jordan Peele is basically putting forward the point that black Americans generally um, internally know, and which white people never write quite grok, is that white people will believe any old occult shit if you call it science. <laughs> You know, we do. It's well, you know, I, I'm I am possibly the whitest person that you've ever had on this podcast, but I, I can I can attest this is true. We do, and you can sort of see that when you look at COVID denialism and stuff like that, right? It's basically occult stuff that people are pretending is science, and. These things are quintessentially folk horror. And that includes also the fact that, I don't know, you go to, in 2019, right? There was a post on Instagram labeled hashtag witches of Instagram every 30 seconds. No, in 2018. By the end of 2019, that had gone up to every two and a half seconds. I don't know what it is now. Um, it, it always makes me that I, I thought folk horror was basically a done deal in 2018 when I saw the Black Philip Funko Pop. I thought it had jumped the shark at that point. Um, and then in 2019, we had Robert Eggers did another movie, Jordan Peele did another movie, and Ari Aster did another movie. And certain so Midsummer is basically to our era, what Pulp Fiction was in 1994 it is the film poster that graces a thousand university halls of residence. A million university halls of residence. It's, it's the film independent enough to be cool, mainstream enough to be popular. Just like Pulp Fiction was back in 1993, 1994 even. And these cinematic trends <laughs> happen because our society is ready for them and i think part of the reason i thought folk horror jumped the shark was because i thought things could have possibly get worse funnily enough a pandemic makes folk horror really possible I, um host actually um a pandemic film made entirely over zoom <laughs> 
last year in the UK. It's on Shudder. It's 65 minutes long. It's a work of genius. It really is. And it is at best watched on a laptop. Scariest on a laptop. That's a host. I haven't actually heard of it. So um, I'll have to both uh, watch it. The next question, I think, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, there we go. Hey, what are the top two or three flicks like everybody should see? Like, what are what are the folk horror movies in your opinion? Uh, the best known, the best representative of the genre. If you're new to folk horror, you got to see these two or three. And can you tell us a few hidden gems that are maybe might be obscure or hard to find or not as well known, but you think are uh, that the people really gotta? Oh man, you got to see this. You like folk horror? You're interested in folk horror? I bet you've never heard of this one. You got to check it out amazing yeah okay um so obviously we talk about the unholy trinity already which one general blood on saints claw and the wicker man of those the best movie is the wicker man so if you had to pick one of those to see it's the wicker man you might also see night of the demon which i believe in the states is called curse of the demon um and there are a number of British television plays as well, which is in central, particularly the British series, which was called Ghost Stories for Christmas. Mm. Um, there was a lot of plays written by Nigel Neal. My favourite is called Murren, which is quite obscure. Um, it broadcast in 1975 and it includes the line, we don't go back, uh. which gave me the title of my book. So why is close to my heart? Um, as for hidden gems, I was looking through my book and thinking about stuff. Now, um, I know that Severin Films, both in their box set and independently, are just about to release a 4K restoration of um, Avery Krantz's 1980s film, Eyes of Fire. They literally had to track the director down and get a print off him to do a restoration of it. Um, and this is a fantastic film set in, um, well, it's set in New England in the backwoods. It was a direct inspiration for Robert Eggers' movie, The Witch. Oh, and incidentally, if you want to watch um, the foundational modern folk horror movies, The Witch, Get Out, Midsummer, obviously. You've probably already seen Midsummer. No. Um, of those, my favourite is Get Out. Easily. Um, Eyes of Fire. Fantastic piece. You might want to think of the Russian movie V, which is also in the Severin Films box set. Um, and that's based on a classic ghost story by Nikolai Gogol. It's... Made in the 1960s, is one of the very few Soviet horror movies. It's glorious, not least because the practical effects in it are fantastic things which work on the level of stage magic. These effects are done with stage magic on the screen. And it is one of the very few um, horror movies that I would call delightful. Um, I think of an English film from the 1970s that's called Psychomania. Psychomania, okay. Psychomania, okay, is the story of a group of undead outlaw bikers who worship a devil manifested in the form of of a toad and represented by a butler played by George Sanders in its last screen role six months before he committed, he ended his life because he was bored. George Sanders best, probably best known in the States for being the voice of Shere Khan on the Jungle Book. Um, although huge long cinema career. Um, oh yeah, and these undead outlaw bikers and sidekicks and butlers who worship the devil in the form of a toad are in the mean streets of Walton on Thames in Surrey. Um, it is in no way a good film. 
and at the same time, utterly tremendous. It needs to be seen. And one more I'm going to name is an American movie from 2013 called Jug Face. Jug Face. Wow. A small independent movie which is directed by a guy called Chad Crawford Kinkle. I think he's, he's recently made another movie, um, which I haven't got around seeing, but I really want to. Chug Face is about backwoods community um, and who worship something in a pit. And it's the intersection of folk horror and Lovecraftian horror. Some Lovecraftian horror is kind of folk horror, although, you know, cosmic horror is kind of a different beast in its own right because. I, it's, I, folk horror, Lovecraftian horror, gotta have a system. Um, anyway, yeah, hats, tentacles. Um, it's different. So yeah, Jug Face. It's wonderful film, made by made for about fifty seven cents American. Fantastic, includes great cast. Larry Fessenden's in it. Um, Sean Young, actually, who you probably remember as, as Rachel in Blade Runner, um, playing playing the uh, terrifying matriarch of the backwards coals. Um, yeah, fantastic movie. There are others I could go on telling you them, but I'm going to stop there because I think Right out of time. <laughs> yeah, but. we we should start to wrap up. But hey, you know that if only there was a book where people who could find out about hundreds of such movies. A book that perhaps looks just like this one, with a wonderful cover by my dear friend Stephen Horry, who's great illustrator and also a great musician who makes music for TV shows. Um, lovely guy. Um, Actually, give us give us your plugs verbally too for those who are listening or uh, 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 you know watching the just with the YouTube on or listening to the podcast version. So, the what's the name of the book again, Howard? We don't go back. A Watcher's Guide to Folk Horror, which came out in two thousand eighteen. So, um, at some point, it's going to be new. I, I will eventually get around to doing a new edition when I write finish writing the, the books I'm working on. I've got three on the go at the moment. Um, because it came out before Midsummer, um, I don't think it's fair to say. But you can find what I think about Midsummer and an account of my interview with Ari Aster on my website, which is room two hundred seven press dot com. Um, folk horror adjacent is um, the work of the British television screenwriter Nigel Neal, um, and I am the co-host along with um, my fearless leader John Deere of the podcast Birdcast. Um, you can find us on Twitter at Birdcast Calling and birdcast.room207press.com. Um, so yeah, um, all of those things are things that I do and there's other things out there as well. Um, occasionally I do online seminars. Occasionally I run an, run, um, an online conference called Rural Gothic. You find us on Twitter at Rural Gothic. Um, which I do in conjunction with the Folklore Podcast, Mark Norman, and Fabulous Folklore Podcast, I.C. Sedgwick. Um, so I've got, you know, a whole lot of um, irons in the fire. And coming up next is a book, well, I have several books. I'm working on one about um, a controversy involving um, a medium in the 1970s that made the national press. Um, the president of the Spiritist National Union was caught faking repeatedly and still got away with it and it made the national news and i'm finishing up writing about that i have been the recipient of a scholarship from the horror writers association to write a book called the question in bodies um the first principles of identity horror and um i've eventually too there's going to be the book i'm writing about planet of the apes as well amazing so that's got a load of stuff on yeah well not to uh the 
we never know what the future will bring and not to bring any spoilers but i suspect this won't be the last time that we we talk uh i really hope that you will you'll come back on and uh there is a a, a, a topic that's uh, dear to my heart that that i'm interested in that i know all of our viewers and listeners will be interested in so it'll be exciting to have you back to talk about that mystery topic uh howard it's been amazing uh have a have an awesome rest of october have an awesome halloween uh and uh thanks again for doing this you too uh, it's been a pleasure thank you for having me on thank you bye